Good morning, my name is Nathan, and I'll be reading the scripture this morning. If you could turn to the seventh book of the Bible, the book of Judges, uh, we'll be reading from the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 4 today. So Judges, chapter 4, and we'll be reading the first ten verses. Again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Herosheth Hagoyim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapideth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go, but if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Thank you, Nathan, for reading that. And I don't know, I think Tim was trying to stump him with all those names in there. So that's pretty impressive that he did all that. Bang on. Well done, Nathan. Good job. Well, um, we're going to be hearing from Tim Strickland in just a moment. Tim and I uh, have about a 12-year history or so, maybe 14, I don't know. Uh, Tim is uh, one of our friends from uh, down south in the fellowship. And so we're connected, and Tim's going to share a little bit about this with uh, about 500 churches nationwide and about 300 in uh, the province of Ontario that uh, all uh, share similar um, statements of belief and, and, and uh, similar uh, progression as we uh, worship the Lord together. And so, if you remember, this is our church health weekend. And so yesterday, Tim met with our leaders and unpacked the church, uh, the church health survey. And this morning, he's going to be preaching on some leadership. But also, we want to invite you all to stay after church for about half an hour to hear the results of that survey. Uh, and... Um, then 15 minutes or so of question and answer. Good news. Your kids are all taken care of for that half an hour to 45 minutes. And so we want to say a special thank you to our Kids Church volunteers who are getting paid double of what they normally get paid <laughs> to do that. And so, which is nothing, but uh, hey, that's all good. We're very thankful. Um, I'm going to pray for Tim as he comes and preach, uh, but why don't you welcome him this morning. Timmons, before we do that, so a big round of applause. Tim, come on up. <clears throat> I'm going to pray over you, brother, here. All right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for a great morning so far. We've been uh, just enjoying a time of worship and uh, drawing near to you. Lord, I pray that as Tim unpacks your word, Lord, that you would teach us about you. Teach us about how we as your followers need to, to follow you. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, you would bless him. Uh, may his words encourage our hearts and challenge us today. And may our hearts be soft to that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kevin. Oh, it is so good to be back with you here in Timmins. This is my third time visiting. I live in Hamilton, Ontario, work out of Cambridge, but it's a joy to come up here and just see what God is doing here at First Baptist. I really hope you can stay after the service just to hear about the uh, survey results and just the good news of what God is doing here in your church, as well as the opportunities you have to move forward even more in Jesus' name. Uh, that's going to be just a good time together. Um, I flew up on a plane to get here and land at the airport. And on the plane, there was a woman sitting beside me. I ended up talking to her and, and uh, hearing a bit about her and her about what I'm doing up in Timmins. And she knew First Baptist. She doesn't attend or anything. She's actually used to live in Timmins, lives in uh, southern Ontario now. But uh, it was encouraging to hear someone just who I happen to be sitting beside know about the work of the food bank and, and what's going on here and had a positive view of that. So praise God for what is happening here. 
I'm going to start by sharing uh, just some pictures of Feb churches all across uh, Ontario and into Quebec. We have 300 churches, five, over 500 across Canada, but 300 approximately. It says 295. It's actually 298 is the actual number. We keep growing, and I have to keep updating the uh, slide presentation. It's a good problem. But I want to just show you this because this gives you a sense of what we are part of together is in, in our fellowship of churches. Uh, there's approximately 46,000 people attending a fellowship church, uh, most of them right as we speak. And so that's pretty amazing to think that we're part of that together. Let's, and this is not your First Baptist. There's a few First Baptists around. This is uh, First Baptist in Cornwall was where I took that picture. Let's take a look at some more. Uh, this is West Park Church in London. They actually have four different congregations who meet at the same time. It's a big church in London. And uh, they have, this is the Chinese congregation worshiping together. They have an English-speaking congregation, a big English congregation. That I say English, it's every, everybody's in the English congregation from all different cultures. And they have an Arabic congregation, and they have a Hispanic congregation. And they all meet at, at, at in the building in different places. Their kids all meet together in one big kids ministry. So it's really cool what's going on there at West Park. And they're baptizing people. They just got a new pastor in the church. Is, I think they have 1,500 people approximately attending the church. It's a really big church uh, pushing towards 1,500. Let's take a look at the next one. This is a Greenfield Park Baptist Church in Montreal, a multicultural church on the south shore of Montreal. And we prayed for them for a while because they needed a pastor, and it's not easy to find pastors to come to Montreal, and, uh, and especially for the English churches. And we were, by God's grace, they found somebody just over the past year, and I kept asking people to pray for this. So it's been a real answer to prayer that God has provided for them. Uh, this is Wilmer Heights Baptist Church in Toronto. That's Dr. Ty Adababwe. And uh, Dr. Ty is just as exciting as he looks in that picture. I mean, he, he, it's an exciting church, the things that go on there. And they're in a tougher part of Toronto, reaching out to people in need right there in city at Victoria Park and Lawrence area, if you know the city of Toronto. And I remember I went and preached there uh, early on when I started with Feb about six years ago. And uh, I've been there since as well. But Neil, the deacon in the middle there who's talking in front of the community, table, he was giving the announcements, and he, and, and brother, you kind of did the same thing, you, you preached the announcements better than I can preach a sermon, and, uh, and so I got, I got to really try hard up here to, to do something good, and, and Neil was doing, doing the same thing, just, just bringing it, and, sh and just encouraging the people, and it, it was really cool to see what God is doing in that, that city church in Toronto. And uh, let's go to another one, Calvary Baptist Church in Ottawa. Pastor Kevin, a couple of your kids have been to this, this church when they were at school there. And uh, Pastor Matt Rudd, they've gone to two services because they were just, they're in this building. You think you're tight in your land space here. They, they are like way more tight. And uh, in urban Ottawa, not far from Parliament, and lots of uh, university students. Is, is your kids there? I, see, they really do go to church when they're away, just in case anyone, <laughs> anyone doubts. That's good news. There they are. There they are when I took that picture. And uh, they, they're pushing towards 400 people in this church. There might be over 400. And that, they have to st stuff everybody into this little building to make this work. But they're moving forward with vision. God is blessing that church. And they're, they're doing renovations and expanding and figuring out how they're going to make the most of the, this little property they have with all these people that God is sending. Do they plant? Do they expand? The kind of things that you're having to think about as a church as you grow and move forward too. Let's take a look at another one. This is our Feb Youth Retreat. They call it Bedlam, and when you get 600 junior high kids together, it is Bedlam. That's why we call it Bedlam. And it's an amazing thing to see God working the lives of our junior highs. We also have big senior high retreats. We've had to add, we keep having to add more retreat weekends. We do it at uh, um, Muskoka Woods in Muskoka. So it's within reach of your church uh, to be able to get there because it's at least far enough north. That it's, it's still far, but you can get there. And uh, we are seeing kids trust in Christ, kids thinking about a future life of leadership in ministry. And uh, we have saw something like around 2,000 youth and their leaders come to all these retreats. And we're going to see more, Lord willing, this year because it keeps growing. And so when you hear challenges with youth, yes, it's true. But there's also amazing things happening in our fellowship with youth coming close to the Lord, trusting in him and walking with him. It's, it's an amazing time. This is our Stronger Leadership Conference we run every year, and we invite your leaders to join us. It'll be in, uh, I think, end of April is the dates of that, and this is just a growing, and we want it to be a signature leadership conference for churches um, in Ontario, and, and it's, that's what it's becoming at Emmanuel and Barrie. Uh, this is my office. I think it's the next picture. It's 
of Heritage where I work and Heritage Seminary is our partner. I'm on the board of Heritage Seminary and exciting things happening in the school there as well. And uh, that's where we are in Cambridge where our, our home base is. Now, I want to uh, share with you what we do as FEB Central. FEB just stands for Fellowship of Evangelical Baptists, and that's what we're part of here together. And there's three main things that we do out of the Cambridge office and uh, in supporting our churches. The first is that we help churches to plant churches. We have a huge church planting movement. It's one of the leading movements, if not the leading movement in the country. We've seen 60 or 70, I'd have to check our numbers, churches planted over the last 10 or 15 years. And so that's significant. It. It's, it's 20, 25% of the churches in Feb Central right now are plants that have recently happened. We, we have a big emphasis on that. This is one of our plants in Mississauga where Graham Melvin is the lead pastor. Let's take a look at another one. This is, uh, uh, we develop leaders. And I was the director of leadership development. I'm now the director of church vitality. But this was the era I was overseeing for a number of years. And this is our youth leader training happening at Heritage. And there was, I think, about 170, 175 youth leaders who were being trained at that event. And then the next one is we help maximize church health. This is what we're doing this weekend here in Timmins. We're doing this consultation, the surveys you all filled out. And uh, this was a consultation we did in Woodstock. And uh, the Lord has just been working there at that church, uh, Faithway in Woodstock. The Lord provided a good interim pastor who really helped them, and then a, a good new lead pastor who just started started this past year, and uh, we were involved just in helping them through that process. It's onwards and upwards there. The last slide, this is my favorite slide that I show. Um, this is Pastor Jim DeMarsh of Milton Bible Church, and actually my brother Mark is now the lead pastor of that church. Jim is now the associate. They traded places effectively, and, uh, but I love the greater things. You've maybe sang the song, Greater Things Are Yet to Come in the City. I don't know if you've sang that song. But I love that idea that God is going to do even greater things. And he's already doing great things here. And I love just thinking about that for not only the church here, but for us as a movement. And reminding us that we're together, Feb Central. I hope you're encouraged, brothers and sisters, by what is going on and what you're part of. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. I, no, I've got a sermon. Actually, that wasn't the sermon. I actually have a sermon. <laughs> But before I do, I want to tell you something. I'm encouraged that you're emphasizing prayer this year in the church. Um, something that my wife Carol and I have doing, and it was at her idea, that, praise God for my wife. She said, you know, Tim, we got to, basically, we got to pray, we got to pray together. And it's not we didn't pray together, but we got to do it more. And we go, we've got to specifically, she said, let's get down on our knees every night before we go to bed and just kneel and pray, particularly for our family and then for other needs as, that we need to pray for. And so Carol and I have been making a real focus to do that, almost, you know, every night uh, doing that. And we have seen prayers answered in just really neat ways. And, and, and not always like, you know, God saved the world prayers, but just what would be seem insignificant or smaller things in our family but that mean a whole lot to us. And just knowing that our, our Father cares for us in that way and, and cares about little prayers. I'll tell you one is... Um, our, our dog got sick, okay? Our dog, we got a dog named Rascal. He's a golden doodle, very cute. But he stopped being all puppy and cute, and he was getting sick. And we took him to the vet, and they don't know what's wrong and all these. And, we, and so we were just like, Lord, we, we were praying for him. Not only for him, because we, we did care about the dog, but our family and our kids deeply care about this dog. And it was that, from that moment, Rascal just got better. We came, and he, was, he just recovered. And, and I look at that, and God answered our prayer. And you think, God, God cares about your dog? Well, yeah, he did, <laughs> and he does. And he cares about my kids, he cares about my family, and just how much that meant to our family. It's a simple thing. But I want to challenge each of you to take up this call that your church has given you to be people of prayer. And some of you couples, maybe you want to do what Carol and I are doing. Get on your knees before you go to bed. Uh, if you're, Maybe you're not a couple, but there's other people in your family. Join with them every day in prayer and just pray for your life and your family. And watch God answer those prayers. Amen? Do it. Do it. All right. Sermon. Now it's time for the sermon. I've got a question for you. How many of you are leaders? Okay, Pastor Kevin, this is great news. There's at least seven, maybe ten leaders at First Baptist Church. This is fantastic. Oh, okay, okay, that was not as enthusiastic as I might have hoped. Um, there, there, this was the, there's like, I'm kind of a leader, maybe. <laughs> Pastor Kevin raised his hand. That was good news. That was good news. Um, okay, another question. Second question. How many of you think that we need more leaders? 
All right, that's, now that's enthusiastic. That's what, I, now, just right away, do you see the problem with what ha just happened there? <laughs> the, the, there's, I know there's more than 10 leaders or the people put up their hands here at first. You got a whole bunch of people leading and serving and doing this. But as leaders, we could even be hesitant to even admit it. But then when we asked, do we need more, everybody's like, yes, please, we need more. <laughs> and, and there's something, there's something going on there. Um, some, some of you here have moved to Canada, maybe even recently. And you might look at these Canadians and say, why are they so polite? Why, why do they not admit they're leaders? Like, you're a leader. Praise God, you're a leader. But there's a, there's a funny thing in, in Canadian culture where we can be a bit, well, hesitant. You know what I mean? We can be a bit shy. We're thinking, if I put up my hand and say I'm a leader, the person behind me might think, oh, they think they're something, don't they? They put up their hand. They're, you know, we get this kind of thought in our head. It's a bit of a humble, polite Canadian thing going on. Uh, and sometimes that actually can impede us as as a church to moving forward, because we need leaders, and leaders are so important. Um, I'm going to preach a message today that's all about leadership, and we need leaders not just in church, but everywhere in society. In our places of business, we need good leadership. In our government, we, we, we need and we need to pray for good leadership and pray for those who are there that God would help them to be good leaders. We need it in health care. We need it in education. We need it in our communities. We need good leadership right in our families. Everywhere you look in life, we need leadership, and everywhere you look in many places, you're thinking, I don't think we have such good leadership at times in areas of our lives, and it's always a concern. Do you know the Bible has lots to say about leadership? In fact, the pages of Scripture are just filled with the stories of God's leaders. From beginning to end, what you find in the Bible, if you're to ask, how does God work? Like, what's kind of his basic strategy of how he gets things done? Uh, I'll tell you what it is. Now, I'll, first I'll tell you what I sometimes wish it was. I wish he would use his almighty power and snap his heavenly hand and get it done, because he could do that, and it would be quick and efficient, much better than, in my mind, my, I'm saying much better, but of course that's not very smart to say I know better than God, because I don't. But in my head, that's what I would want to see happen. But instead, what he does is he calls people like you and me imperfect humble people like us, and he says, I'm going to work through you, or you. I'm calling you to do something, and you say, pardon me? <laughs> and God says, you. And you say, I can't do that. He says, I know. I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to do it through you. That's how it's going to get done. And he chooses to work through people like us to accomplish his work. And the story of the Bible is him raising up his leaders to lead his people to do his work. And God's people rise or fall on whether or not the leader follows God and whether or not the people follow the leader who follows God. That's what happens on virtually every page of the Bible. That's the story that is happening. Leadership is so important, and we don't talk about it enough. Think of all the great leaders in the Bible, in the Old Testament, people like you know, Abraham, like Moses, like David, Isaiah, and we could go on down the list of these great heroes of the Bible. In the New Testament, um, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, uh, John, uh, m multiple Johns, actually. <laughs> all these great leaders. And, of course, the greatest leader of all time, who was that? Sunday school answer, please. Jesus. He's the greatest leader ever. He's the, and and there's, there's actually a hunger within us as human beings to have good leadership. And that's why every time, every, about every decade, we get sick of the political leaders we have. And, but, but if you look back 10 years ago when we had, and not just now, I mean just any time, you look back at the leader we had, whoever it was at whatever level politics, at that time, he was the one or she was the one. Oh, we're going to have a better day with this new political leader. And we all get excited. This is the one. And then it's, it reminds me a bit of, uh, do you remember Charlie Brown? There's an old cartoon, Charlie Brown, and he had this friend named Lucy, and he would go kick a football. And, and the idea is she would hold the football like a punter, and he would kick the football. But the thing is, she would always pull the football away, every time. And he would go flying. And she would say, this time I'll, I won't pull it away. And every time she'd pull it away, and he'd go flying. And that's what we're like with leaders. This time it's the one. And then every time, a decade or so later, like, I don't think that was the one. Because, but there's something in us that hungers for that almost messianic leader. 
And there's a reason for that. It's because we were created by God with a hunger in our hearts to worship a leader who is good and true and who does righteousness and justice and leads us well. And one of the great attractions to trusting in Jesus is that he actually is that leader. He, he's not the leader who is the football pulled away and letting us down once again. He's the leader who comes through, and we look forward to the day he returns again when he will establish this world in righteousness and justice, the new heavens and the new earth, and we will have that true good leadership that we long for in our hearts. But in the meantime, he works through people like us, this great leader, the lover of our souls, the great leader of the universe he leads and works through us. Now turn to the book of Judges if you've got that open. Oh, by the way, I had a bunch of sermon notes, and they're sitting on the table at the back. And they actually really help you follow the sermon. And I don't know if there's any elders, leaders. If, if you don't have sermon notes, there's a whole ton of them. They could pass them around. That would be a big help because I think if you didn't get them, that would be a big help. Th oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Judges chapter 4. We are looking in the book of Judges. Now, Judges is an interesting book. When we hear the word judge, we think of a courtroom and a judge, maybe a guy with a black robe and a wig or something. Uh, but the judges in the book of Israel, or in the book of Israel, in the nation of Israel, in the book of Judges, were not uh, courtroom judges. They actually were leaders, and they were a combination of military, uh, political, and spiritual leaders all wrapped up into one. And what happened in Israel at that time is they were constantly uh, turning away from the Lord, falling into sin, and then God would let them fall into oppression. He'd hand them over to these various nations around them. Then they'd start praying, crying out to God, asking for help, and he'd raise up a judge, a leader, who would help deliver them from their enemies and help them try to come back to the Lord. And it was interesting. They were better at receiving the deliverance from their enemies than they were at receiving the come back to the Lord part of the equation. But in Judges chapter 4, we have a judge whose name is Deborah and her sidekick, Barak. It says in Judges 4 verse 1, I'm going to read it. I appreciate the reading, and you did great with those names. I've had to practice them a lot. Uh, let's read it 4 verse 1. It says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud, who was the previous judge, after Ehud died. <clears throat> and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harashish Hagayim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he cruelly oppressed the people of Israel. He oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Let's just pause for a word of prayer here, and then we're going to keep looking at the Word of God and see what it says about leadership. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the people of First Baptist Church, and I thank you for the good work that is going on here. I thank you for the good leaders you've raised up in this church. Some are pastors on staff, lay leaders, people serving in children's, all these areas. I thank you for that, O oh Lord. And I pray your blessing now as we look into your word. I pray you'd teach each one of us more about leadership and perhaps show some of us where we need to be serving, where we need to be stepping up and leading and trusting you to do the work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've got this scene in Israel. They're under oppression for 20 years. That would be as if we were under oppression since 2004, because it's 20 years. It's 2024 now. Imagine that, 20 years of being under foreign oppression. This enemy has 900 chariots of iron, which does not sound impressive to us today, but in those days, that was like having an M1 Abrams battle tank, and, and, and you had slingshots or something, and it wasn't, it wasn't going to work. You weren't going to win against that kind of power. Now in verse 4, what is going to be the solution to this crisis? It says, now Deborah, usually, by the way, people cheer when I mention her name. Uh, now Deborah, thank you, thank you, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah. Thank you, thank you. She had a tree named after her. That's, that's good. You know you made it when that happens. Um, and uh, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. So here we have Deborah. She's this, pro thank you, she's this prophetess who is, who is the judge of Israel. Now, right away when you read this story, and if you've read stories in the Bible, you know that there's something different happening in this story compared to most of the other stories. What, what's happening that's different right away? Female, Deborah's a woman. And she's the one leading. And all God's women said, yeah. <laughs> About time. 
There she is. And she is, she is the judge. People come up to her for judgment, so she, she does help in the, in the oversight of the nation. And she is seen as this leader. And she would sit there. Now, her name, Deborah, do you know what Deborah means, the name Deborah? It means honeybee, honeybee. So I like to think of Deborah as the woman who dances like a butterfly and stings like a, like a bee. She is. She, she's something, this girl. She is, she is she's doing it. She's leading the way. And so there she is in this time of oppression. It says, verse 6, she sent and summoned Barak. Now, when I say Barak, people usually say, woo, and not boo. Some people thought I was saying boo once. It's not boo, it's woo. It's impressive. They say, woo. Summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him. But do, do you know what Barak's name means, by the way? His name means lightning. His name means lightning. So this guy is fast, he's quick, he's, he's powerful. And in fact, today in Israel, in modern-day Israel, some of their tanks, they call them Barak. They actually still use that name today. It's fascinating to see that, that biblical name still being used today of their tanks. So they've got Barak, our lightning man, the son of Abinoam. And Deborah says to him, this is in verse 6, Has not the Lord... The God of Israel commanded you, go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Do you hear what's happening in the story? Deborah is giving a prophetic word from God and is giving that word to Barak, saying God has called you to go take the troops, go fight this guy with all his chariots, and God is going to give you the victory. It's a prophetic word from God. How does our hero Barak, our lightning man, respond? Listen to this. He says in verse 8, Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Hmm. Hmm. Lightning man, eh? Hmm. Uh, th th this is a bit, bit, bit strange. Um, and again, in the story, here we have Barak, who is a male leader, a strong general, able to rally tons of troops. He's a respected, competent general. And he says to a female leader, I'll go if you go, in a very patriarchal, male-dominated culture. This, this is bizarre, what is happening. Th this is not the kind of well, courage, frankly, that we're looking for. It is, it, is it, ladies? <laughs> Who's the one showing courage? It's Deborah. She's the one saying God is going to do it. He says, I'll go if you go. What, what an answer. And she said, I will surely go with you. Because, of course, she does. She's the hero. And she's trusting the Lord. Nevertheless, she says, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Huh. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh, and Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali, two of the tribes of Israel, to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Isn't this a wild story? I'm going to pause there in the reading. I'm not going to read the whole story. Spoiler alert, Israel wins. Uh, read it ahead, though. It's fascinating what happens. There's some inter interesting, interesting things that happen in this story. But God does deliver them, gives them the victory, in fact, you know what they do at the end? In chapter 5, they sing a song about their victory and they celebrate the leaders. They actually write a song about leadership. And it says, Deborah and Barak, the son of Obinoam, they, this is what they sang, it says in the text, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. It says in verse 11 of chapter, or 10, of, where is it there? Verse 9, it says in chapter 5, My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel, who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. So when was the last time our worship team sang the leadership song? I don't even think we have one like that, <laughs> where you celebrate the leaders. But that's what they did. They sang a song of praise where they celebrate leaders who were leading. Now, I think Barak had a lot of nerve putting his name to be one of the ones who wrote this song. <laughs> because... There's something that Barak was not doing as a leader in this story. It's, it's a really key thing. It's a really key thing for leaders to do that he wasn't doing. Uh, does anyone know what 
Barack was not doing as a leader? I heard it. Leading. The guy wasn't leading. In fact, this brings us to the main point of this sermon. If you get one point, this is the point of the sermon. This is my big point. And I, I want to tell you, I, I've, I've, I've uh, studied leadership. I went to seminary. I went twice, actually. The second time was better. And, uh, um, and so this, this point is years of study, research, blah, blah, you know. So this could be amazing. Be ready for it. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. God has something he does. He calls Oh, it's on the screen already. God, God calls leaders to lead. Wow, wow. Wow. Nobody looks really impressed with that revelation. <laughs> of course, I'm being a bit silly with you all, and I appreciate you laughing along, but this is kind of obvious, is it not? I mean, this is ridiculous. I didn't have to go to seminary once to learn that. We all know that. The point of a leader is to lead. It's in the Word. And yet, in this story, what is the key thing the leader isn't doing? He's not leading. Praise God, Deborah was leading, or we would have had real trouble in this story. God calls leaders to lead. And yet, all throughout society, yet all over the place, we have struggles with leadership. Not good enough leaders or just not enough leaders. And even we, if, if we, let's just, remember that question I asked at the beginning, those two questions? We who are leading are often afraid to even kind of admit that we're leading. It's no wonder we can't find enough leaders. <laughs> God calls leaders to lead. Well, let's talk about leadership, spiritual leadership. What is spiritual leadership? Henry Blackaby has a fantastic definition. He's written that spiritual leadership is moving people onto God's agenda. It's not me as a leader coming up with some grand scheme or plan. Uh, we need plans as leaders, but it, it's, it, that's not the first thing we need. We need God to be doing his work, watching what he is doing. And then our job is to follow after that and lead God's people in what he is already doing. What is God saying in his word? How is he leading his people by his spirit? And how do we get on board with that and get everyone else on board? That's what leaders do. Now, leadership is both a Christian role and a spiritual gift. And I want to explain what I mean by that. God gives spiritual gifts. That's abilities through which he empowers us to serve in the church and the body of Christ and, and to those around us. He gives us these gifts, and there's all kinds of these gifts that he gives us. Um, service, teaching, generosity, mercy, uh, and the list goes on. And leadership is one of those gifts. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, the Lord says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And one of those gifts, it says, the one who leads with zeal. And it talks about all the other gifts as well, many of the other ones. So some people have a gift of leadership, and they're really good at leading, and they just naturally kind of seem to know how to lead. And it's, it's not just natural, it's supernatural as God empowers them. But there's other people who have all kinds of other gifts. There's gifts I've mentioned of service, of teaching, and, and so on. And what I want to point out about the spiritual gifts is that, generally speaking, the gifts are also things that Christians should be doing anyways. They're Christian roles. Let me just give an example. Uh, there's a gift of mercy where people just have a real heart for those who are in downtrodden and in need and really want to help people when they're down. Now, we would never, though, say, would the people with the gift of mercy help those in need, and the rest of us, we really don't care, and we're going to do something else. We, we would never say that. That would be awful, actually. Whether or not you have the gift of mercy, you're called to help those in need. But those with the gift of mercy are better at it. They have a deeper heart for it, and, and it's just amazing to watch them do it. But the rest of us still do it, and we can make a real impact by doing it. Uh, what about the gift of service? That's people who just seem to get everything done around the church. The church would not survive without people with the gift of service who are showing up here early. They're cleaning things up. They're moving chairs. They're, they're doing everything to make this place available for all of us to worship. Now imagine, I'm sure you rearrange these chairs sometimes so you can do other events in this room. I'm sure you rearrange things sometimes. I doubt that, you know, Pastor John or Kevin or one of your leaders gets up here and said, would the people with the gift of service rearrange the chairs for us? The rest of us are going to have cake downstairs and while well, the service people move the chair. That would be crazy. We'd say, that's ridiculous. We're, because we're all called to serve. Now, the people with the gift of service have already moved five chairs before I've got up out of my seat because uh, they're, they're gifted. They're quick. They're, they're, they're just like on it, moving, doing, doing the work. The same is true of the gift of leadership. It's a gift and a role. Let, let, let me illustrate this a bit more. Uh, I, growing up, uh, 
you're not going to believe this, but I wasn't the most amazing athlete. I, 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 I could do it a bit, but I was, I was kind of middle of the pack, and if I worked at something, I could get kind of okay at it, you know? And, uh, and, and so I, I got playing volleyball. I got playing volleyball. And I actually worked hard at it and got kind of good at it. Good enough, they let me be the starting setter on my high school uh, team. And, uh, and, and I actually, I didn't do everything right, but I did some things right. I even occasionally could jump high enough to get a spike. It took a lot of effort, but sometimes I got there. And, uh, and so I was playing ball, and I worked hard at it, and I'd done pretty well. Well, I went to camp, the camp I went to in the summer, and I was a counselor there. And I had another friend who was a counselor, and his name was James Lackey. Oh, James Lackey. James Lackey was one of these people who was just a natural athlete, you know. Uh, he, was, he was really good at basketball. He had an amazing, actually, three-point shot. He could just really shoot well, and he was just an athlete. He was good at stuff. In fact, James went on to be a teacher and to be a, a coach, a high school coach at a Christian school in Toronto, and he actually coached a, a fine young man named Steph Curry. And if you know basketball in the NBA, Steph Curry went on to become the most prolific uh, three-point shooter, arguably in NBA history for Golden State. And he's famous and well known for that. And my, my friend James actually coached Steph Curry. And when Toronto uh, Raptors a few years ago played Golden State, uh, and it was the big championship, uh, they interviewed James because they heard about this. And, uh, and they said, how did you coach Steph Curry? And James Lackey said, well, I'd get the boys around, we'd gather in a huddle, and I'd say, okay, boys, here's the plan. Pass the ball to Steph. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the plan. That's how you coach Steph Curry. And, uh, but anyways, we're at camp back in the day, all before James ended up coaching Steph Curry. And uh, we're playing beach volleyball. And remember, I've been working at this, getting better at it. I'm, I think I'm pretty good, you know. James doesn't care about, he, he's basketball. He doesn't care about uh, volleyball. And you know where this story is going. The guy is keeping up with me, maybe even beating me, and he doesn't even play volleyball because he's an athlete. Do you know how annoying that is? You know, annoying that? Do you feel my pain? What's going on here? Well, that guy's naturally gifted. He's got a gift for athletics. I have a little one. It's not very big. And if I work at something, I can get kind of competent at it. But I actually was able to be the start and setter and have a lot of fun doing it. And it made a difference for our team, I hope. It's like that with the gifts, and it's like that with the gift of leadership. Because a whole lot of you are thinking, I'm not a leader, I don't want to be a leader, I'm not gifted to be a leader, somebody else can lead. Well, let's rethink that a bit. Because some of you, God is going to need to lead in ways you never have before. In this consultation, we're going to talk about it later, do you know how much this church has been growing over the past decade? This church has doubled in size over the past decade or so. Um, did, have you seen how many people are getting baptized in this church? 24 people this year alone have been baptized in this church, praise God. That, you're blowing the doors off things here. I mean, you're, you're, you're just, it, it's amazing what is happening here. But all of that good news, you know what it creates? More work, more ministry to be done. And the way, the way things work in a church is that God works through leaders. And not just the leaders you most often see up front, but leaders who are leading in every area of ministry of the church. And your city here, I, I know there are great needs here in your city. Uh, there's, there's so much to be done in the name of Jesus to help those in need, to bring them the message of Jesus and hope. That happens as leaders rally other people in the church and we serve together and those leaders follow what God is doing and join in. And there's more things to be done than we have leaders in the church right now. Some of you are going to need to step up and lead. And you're going to be like me with volleyball. It may not be your number one thing, but you actually get okay at it and actually start making a difference. God can do that in you. And I want to plant that thought in your head. Well, I don't want to plant it. I hope God plants that thought in your head through me. That God could use you to be a leader who never thought that you could be. Well, what, what, what's the struggle with leadership? Why do people resist, or what are the obstacles to leading? I want to talk about that right now. There's a number of reasons, I think, why people are hesitant to lead at times. Uh, one is that they fear criticism. This is going to be shocking news to you, but did you know that sometimes people criticize leaders? I'm sure you have never criticized a leader, but other people, you've seen them do it. <laughs> We've all criticized our leaders because uh, we, we, we've seen things that aren't right that could be done better. And sometimes we think, I don't want to be on the receiving end of that. And yet, you know what? We need to take courage and be bold. And you know what? If you lead, you will be criticized. I'm not going to tell you you won't be. At times, you will be. 
But you know what? You learn from that. You, sometimes there's good feedback, even if it's not delivered as nicely as you would like. And you learn, and you be bold, and let God grow you as a leader. Um, I was talking to, uh, it's Sean, your, your, your intern, right? And he's leading junior high. That's where I started leading in church. One of the places I started, I was leading junior high at the church I was at. And uh, you, you learn a lot when you're leading junior high. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but you learn a lot. And all of us start somewhere leading in some, in, in some way, and God helps us as we do it. We misunderstand humility. That's another reason people hesitate with leadership. What do I mean by that? Well, I think we saw it at the beginning when I asked how many are leaders. As Christians, we understand that we are supposed to be humble. The Lord teaches it is vital to be humble. In fact, the greatest leaders are the servant leaders. And so when someone asks you a leader, there's something in us that says that might not be humble if I get too excited and stick my hand up too high or at all. But I want to say that's a misunderstanding of humility. Be, being proud is when you say, I'm great, and it's because of how great I am, and I want everybody to know it. That's being proud. It's not proud to say I'm good at something, and I can help and make a difference, because God has gifted us. In Romans chapter 12, the passage I was referencing just a moment ago, the Bible teaches in Romans 12, 3, we're to have an accurate assessment of ourselves, not too hot, not too cold, just right, like Goldilocks, if you remember Goldilocks, the old story. Uh, where she drank, ate the porridge, not too hot, not too cold, just right. We need to have an accurate assessment of our gifts. And if you're capable of doing something and you don't tell anybody, you're afraid to admit it, then how does that help anyone? We need to have an accurate assessment of ourselves and share that when it's appropriate. Um, years ago, I was mentored by a Christian businessman. He actually came from a Catholic background, this Christian businessman. His name was Paul Ronkel, but he was a, a strong believer, and he would run the Alpha course in the Catholic Church. The priest there would let him run Alpha. It was kind of cool. And anyways, he, he mentored me. And, uh, and Paul, when we were getting the business leaders together, and asking them, why do you want, we asked them, why do you want to be a mentor? Or why do you think you should be a mentor? And Paul... Who had, he said, because I'm good at it. And I thought, oh, he's not been in like an evangelical church. You're not supposed to answer because I'm good at it. That's, the, that's not the humble answer, I thought. But, in, but I realized, no, actually, Paul was doing better than the rest of us. He was good at it. He did it in his business career all the time. And it was a blessing for me to be mentored by this man. And there's times we need to say the reason I should do that is because I'm, I'm good at it. <laughs> and for some of you, Leadership is the one, and you need to not understand humility well. We view leadership negatively. That's another reason. We've seen bad examples of leadership, and there's lots of bad examples, and we say, I don't want to be that, so we don't lead. That's not a good reason. Just because some people do it badly doesn't mean the rest of us shouldn't step up and say, Lord, by your power, I want to actually do it right. God can use us to do it well, especially when we lead according to his ways and his character, humble servant leadership. Maybe you feel inadequate. A lot of people say, well, I, I would do it if I could, but I, I don't have the ability. I, again, just look at the Scripture. Look at the people God chose to lead. Often, when he called them, that was kind of what they said. I, I'm not really able to do that. And as I already mentioned in the sermon, God would say, well, that's right. That's, you're not, but I'm going to do it through you. We're going to work together on this. And God empowers you, and people who never thought they could end up doing amazing things as God works through them. Maybe you say, well, I have a busy life. Uh, now, I, I can't imagine that you're busy here in Timmins. It's just quiet, laid back, fishing, stuff like that, right? right and, yeah, right. You're just as busy as anybody else in Canada. I know you are. This is a real reason why people are hesitant to lead, because we're, we're, just, we're just so busy, 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 busy. Here's the thing. If we're too busy to do things that God wants us to do, could it be possible we're doing the wrong things? <laughs> Could it be possible that maybe we need to reprioritize something so we're not too busy to do what God needs us to do? We're all busy. I understand that, and I respect that. I know what our world is like. And yet, we look at our Lord Jesus. He always seemed to have time to do what needed to be done, and he only did his ministry for about three years, and yet he got it all done. We're busy, but we can find a way as God enables us. The last obstacle I'll mention is we want to avoid the weight of leadership. There's no getting around that there's a weight when you're the leader. If ever you've led something, you realize, I'm kind of responsible for this. And it's, if it goes well, it's on me. If it doesn't go well, it's on me. <laughs> and, and, and also, there, there's a commitment. And you actually have to show up is another thing. You know that? Uh, when you're the leader, it's, it's kind of a pain. You have to show up at times. <laughs> uh, 
Do you ever on Sunday, there's another church that maybe some of you have been to. It's called um, Bedside Baptist. Do you, do you know this church, Bedside Baptist? It's a lovely, soft, warm church, very comfortable, cozy place to be in. Many people like to go to Bedside Baptist on Sunday, a lot of Sundays, actually. And uh, the problem with being a leader is you don't get to go to Bedside Baptist because you've got to be here for whatever's going on when you're leading in the church. There's a weight to leadership, but there's a joy in seeing God's work done and seeing him do things through the, that you thought you could never do. Well, what do leaders do? What's their practices? What do leaders do? Well, there's a few things they do. I'm not going to share them all. But there was a business book by a couple guys named Coos and Posner. They weren't Christians to my knowledge. They were business professors, I think, out of Stanford. Uh, and anyways, they did all this research, study, figuring out what is the best practices of, what are the best practices of leaders? And they found a whole bunch of biblical principles is what they actually found. Not through looking in the Bible, but just through studying leadership across cultures and all different areas of life. Here's what they found leaders do. They found first leaders model the way. And again, the Lord teaches that's just fundamental to what we do as leaders, that we're not just telling people to do stuff, we're practicing what we preach. We're to model what we're asking others to do. They also found that the best leaders inspire a shared vision. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means they say things like, wouldn't it be great if, they, they like sentences that start that way, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if we had so many volunteers in our kids' ministry that uh, we, we just had so many we didn't know what to do? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yes, it would be great. And they inspire that and give us a picture of something amazing that could be that isn't right now. Leaders inspire a shared vision. Thirdly, leaders challenge the process. Now, what does that mean? All it means is they look at the way we're doing something and say, there's a better way. We can do this better in a way that impacts more people and honors God and makes a difference. And this is why sometimes leaders get criticized, by the way, because people often like the way we're doing it already. <laughs> it may not be working, but it, at least we're doing it. <laughs> and leaders have to gently say, no, there, there's a better way that I think we can get this done. Fourthly, leaders enable others to act. They don't do it all themselves. Yes, they model it, but they actually try and get other people involved in doing it. That's one of the key jobs of a leader is to find other people and develop other leaders. That's what leaders do. And then leaders encourage the heart. They understand that we're not just machines uh, producing, you know, producing mechanical goods as much as we need that in society. But we are actually human beings with hearts and souls who at times the best way we can get something done is to stop and laugh or cry or both <laughs> and just encourage one another together before we move forward. Well, let me ask you, how can I start leading? Ask that in your heart. Here's a couple principles. First of all, service is the gateway and the heartbeat of leadership. Let me say that again. Service is the gateway and heartbeat of leadership. If you're not sure how to lead, you need to make sure you start serving. Uh, because Jesus said the greatest leaders are servants. Therefore, if you want to find a leader, go look for a great servant. They might be the next one to lead, and that might be you. In fact, I'll tell you a, uh, a story of uh, a woman when I was pastoring in Toronto. I was pastoring a city church in Toronto, uh, landlocked like you are, not, not much parking or anything at all. And um, we had a, a young woman come to our church, her and her husband, they came, and her name was Nikki. And uh, Nikki came and very quickly got involved in the church. She was helping down the kitchen, just doing stuff. And I, I don't know if anybody had asked her. She just seemed to start doing things, and not with any bravado. She just was getting it done, helping the church. And our people, we noticed this. And we saw the servant heart in Nikki and the willingness to serve and get involved. And we actually ended up inviting Nikki to get involved in our children's ministry, and she became our part-time director of children's ministry. I know you've added someone recently in the past few years, uh, Sarah, to be your children's director, and I know there's amazing things happening down there even as we speak. So it's the same kind of scenario. And Nikki got doing this. We ended up having all these weeks of kids' camp. We were a little church. We weren't near as big as you are here. We were a smaller church. And we were running... I forget how many weeks of kids' camp. It was five or more weeks in Toronto. Other churches were coming and doing, like, missions teams to help us run our kids' camp. And, uh, and, this, and Nikki was a key part of that uh, in, the, in the earlier years we were doing that. And uh, all this happened as a result of us seeing somebody serving. 
and ask them to do something more. And she stepped up to it, and God really used her. That story can be repeated again here. I'm sure it has been repeated here, and it could be you who it gets repeated in again. Service is the gateway. The second thing, if you're faithful with little, God will entrust you with more. You might say, well, I'm leading something, but I've got one volunteer and half a pencil, and it's not even sharpened. <laughs> and that's the resources they gave me to do this job. And the person doesn't show up. That's the other thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, that might be what you've got to lead with. You know what? Don't despise the small things, God says. You might think, what I'm doing is small. It's only making a little difference. God loves that kind of thing. He loves to work through small things and things that seem insignificant in the eyes of the world, but that are powerful and can expand little as much when God is in it. There was an old hymn that said that. If you're faithful with little, God will entrust you with more. So how do I start leading? I hope you're inspired. <laughs> First, ask the Lord to use you as a leader. Warning, this is the kind of prayer that God might answer really quickly. Uh, so if you're going to pray this, make sure you mean it, because... You might be shocked this week what happens, how God brings you into some kind of opportunity to lead. The first step, though, is ask him. I love praying prayers like this, though, where I know God wants me to pray that kind of prayer, and I know he wants, he wants to answer that kind of prayer as he finds a willing servant. Ask the Lord to use you as a leader. Secondly, you don't have to wait on this. You can do this today. Practice leadership at home. When we look at the qualifications for elders or pastors in the Bible, you know what one of the key qualifications are? That they manage their home well. And there's a reason for that. We're supposed to be leaders in the home before we're leaders in public. You say, how do I lead in the home? Well, it can be really simple things like saying, family, let's pray about this before we just go out and do whatever we're going to do. You can say, family, let's make sure we read the Bible and see what God has to say to us today. It's just keeping nudging our family in the direction of God and making sure we're leading by example ourselves. Moms, dads, that's a role you have. Grandparents, that's a role you have in your family. Brothers, sisters, siblings, some of you need to be doing that amongst your siblings. We all can do that in gentle ways, not in some telling everybody what to do way, but in gentle ways, leading our family both by example and just encouraging with a gentle word of let's put God first in our family. Start doing that. Third, practice or develop your leadership ability. I mean, there's so much you can learn about leadership. On the back of your notes, I've listed some resources that would be wonderful resources for you to get. And I'm sure your church library has some good resources on leadership as well. Offer to serve where there's a need in the church. Uh, there's needs in this church. All the growth has caused more needs. And offer to serve and watch how God might raise you into leadership, even as you serve and help others on a team. And finally, if you're leading already, invite others to lead. Um, one of my favorite old movies is uh, Star Wars. You've seen Star Wars? Some of you seen Star Wars? It's a story of a, a space war, and it's very exciting. And they have a robot who's a little blue and white robot. His name is R2-D2. And R2-D2, he's an amazing robot. He's, all, he's always there to save the day. And he has a radar in his head. So what happens is he's got his head, and this radar pops out of his head, and goes beep, 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 and he looks around, and he's able to report on what's going on because he's got a radar in his head. It would be handy if we all had a radar in our head like that. And R2-D2 has a radar in his head. As a leader, you need to have an imaginary radar in your head. And that radar is focused and tuned in on finding lead more leaders. One of the problems sometimes as leaders, we're so busy doing leading that we forget to look for other leaders. As a leader, you're always with your R2-D2 radar going beep, 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 leader, potential leader, future leader, and asking people to step up and serve. Sometimes they can do it today. Sometimes it's going to be six months from now when they're available. But make sure as a leader you're asking others to lead. All right, that's the sermon. Let me finish. Brothers, sisters, I'm going to do the inspire the vision thing. It was one of the points. Wouldn't it be great if... First Baptist Church in Timmins had so many leaders doing so many good things that they didn't know what to do with all the leaders that they had. Pastor Kevin says yes. Wouldn't it be great if this was a place that your community looked at and said that there's good leaders in that place. There's good, humble people who are doing the work, getting it done, and making our city a better place. Wouldn't it be great 
if leadership was something that this church was known for. Not, not for the sake of us being known, but for the sake of God's work going forward, his work getting done in his powerful name. This can happen here. It's amazing what is happening here, what God is doing that this church couldn't imagine a decade or so ago. But there's more to be done. And it's going to happen as God raises up his servants, some who become leaders who do his work in his name. Amen? Amen. Let's sing and let's sing loud in response today.